Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the 2015 President's Dinner and Alumni Hall of Fame. Yeah. I like that. That's good. We have, some, we have some gators out in the audience, right? Gators, let's hear it. <laughs> My name is Robert Nava, and I have the privilege of serving as the Vice President for University Advancement at San Francisco State. And this evening, friends, this evening, we have an amazing celebration in store for you because what we're going to be doing tonight is that we're going to be celebrating five, five of our over 200,000 alumni that are doing great things all over the state of California the United States and internationally. And tonight we are gonna honor five outstanding San Francisco State Gators. <laughs> Give it up, yeah. You know, at the beginning of the school year, there's really, there's so many exciting events that occur throughout the year of, you know, the, the deans and the colleges and the students, they organize terrific events and lectures and symposia, et cetera. But in my opinion, I think we have three signature events, three signature events that we celebrate every academic year. The first one is in the fall, when President Wong and our provost, Dr. Sue Rosser, welcome the new faculty in the fall for the faculty convocation. And that's always outstanding, because we are welcoming the new faculty that join the university. The other event, of course, is held in May, and that's the annual commencement celebration. How many of you were at uh, AT&T Park uh, this May? <laughs> yeah, President Wong raises his hand. He was definitely was there, because it was his idea, because we've taken our graduation to a whole different level. You remember alums, you remember alumni, you, you celebrated your, your, your commencement probably at uh, Cox Stadium, and, and a few here might have done it uh, even in other locations back in the 50s. But today, the way our university has grown, we hold commencement at AT&T Park, and it's incredible. So I think that's the second big event. And the last one, in my opinion, that we celebrate is tonight. The President's Dinner and the Alumni Hall of Fame because President Wong will provide a brief update to the alumni and friends of the university about where we are and where the university is going. And then, after dinner, we celebrate outstanding narratives and stories of our alumni. So it's gonna be a very, very special evening. You know, on your program, and please, please proceed with your salads, uh, but the, you know, this evening, in, in past years, we, we held our event this event was held at uh, Julia Morgan Ballroom, and that was fabulous. But we outgrew it. Last year, you'll recall, we had 280 uh, alumni and friends at Julia Morgan. We outgrew that beautiful facility. So we brought it here to the Ritz-Carlton. And we have almost 400 alumni and friends here tonight. What do you all think? With all our alumni, we may have to move this to AT&T Park in the next few years. I, I'm not sure, President Wong. I did want to say that our, this event is made possible. We don't spend state resources on this event. This is all made possible by sponsorships, by table sponsorships, and by our alumni and friends who purchase tickets, so we appreciate that. And I would ask, on your program, when you have a moment, please, uh, at the last page, I, I wanted to highlight and thank our, our sponsors that have done so much to support us. And um, I, I'm not going to point out everyone because they're back here, but Axiom Development Corporation has been a terrific supporter. Axiom Development Corporation, thank you, alum. <laughs> our friends, thank you so much. And, and a year and a half ago, the university uh, established a new partnership with Comcast, NBC Comcast, and we've been very fortunate to start building a relationship to benefit our students and our faculty and a great collaboration for the community. 
So we wanted to thank uh, Scott Adams and the table from Comcast for your support. Scott, where, where are you? Comcast, thank you. Thanks for all the work you do on digital issues and connecting the community. We have a great partnership. You know, everyone, everyone here tonight deserves a, a special introduction, but we're not gonna do that. <laughs> but there are a few individuals I would like to point out with your permission. And I wanted just to take a moment and recognize alumni. This is important. I wanted you to recognize the, uh, the leadership of the university that supports our president, Les Wong. I wanted to acknowledge our provost, Dr. Sue Rosser, Provost Rosser. For those of you that aren't sure, what, well, what is the provost? What does the provost do? Our provost is the chief academic officer. She oversees the, the colleges, works closely with the deans, addresses all those important issues to ensure that our students have the highest quality education. Also, our vice president for finance and administration, Ron Cortez, is here. Ron and his team. And what the university is all about is students, right? That's the core of what we do, it's our students. And the Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Lolo Hong, is here. Lolo. Tonight we're gonna honor alumni leaders, but with us today we actually have our student leaders. We have very much the presence of the university, in the future, I wanted to recognize the president of the Associated Students of the University, Phoebe Dye. Phoebe. And also the students of the Associated Students that do so much work on the campus. Students, thank you. In fact, would all the students that are here, would you stand up? Students at the tables, all of our students, please stand up. Thank you. Alumni, I want you to know that your philanthropy and the gifts that you make to San Francisco State to support scholarships and endowed chairs and other programmatic support are stewarded by the university's foundation. We're very fortunate to have 32 key business and civic leaders. Half of our foundation board are alumni of the university. And tonight we have the chair of the foundation board David Serrano Sewell. David? And quickly, I do want to point out our board members, Dana Corbin, who is here, Netta Nobari, and Mary Huss. Thank you, Foundation board members, for all the work that you do for our university. Also, our Alumni Association Chair, Monica Brooks is here with us as well, our Alumni Board of Directors. Monica, thank you for being here as well. <laughs> Friends, I'm gonna take just a moment because I do wanna recognize several individuals that we need to, to thank and acknowledge. Um, you know, with us this evening, in 2014, President Wong established a relationship with an institution of higher education in Baja California called CETIS, a wonderful private university. And with us this evening, we have a number of the board of trustees of CETIS and the dean of their campus from Ensenada. So friends from CETIS, thank you for being here with us this evening. Your university is also international. And with us, we also have great friends from the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office from Taiwan, and they're with us. And I wanna point out that we have one of the most uh, active and dynamic alumni chapters in the world in Taiwan. So thank you, good friends from Taipei and Taiwan. A special introduction, so I hope you all are ready, because we have really several political rock stars in the audience tonight, but 
I, I want to take a moment and, and acknowledge and, and welcome Mr. George Schultz. Ladies and gentlemen, our former Secretary of State, Mr. Schultz. Mr. Schultz, thank you for your service to our country and for so advising so many presidents over the years. What a pleasure it is to have you and to have Mrs. Charlotte Schultz with us. Charlotte, would you please stand? The Chief of Protocol for the State of California and the City and County of San Francisco. Another rock star. I'm going to ask to come up to the, uh, to the podium. You know, there, there's several individuals that are, are known all over the world that you don't even need to introduce them. You just kind of say their first name and people know who you're talking about. Like, you know, Bono or Cher, uh, Noah. Well, we have a person that sometimes if you just say Willie, Willie, you know who we're talking about. The Honorable Willie Brown, alumnus of San Francisco State University. One of the leading elected officials, politicians in the United States. On, on Wednesday, it was Wednesday or Thursday, Mayor Brown was on campus doing a seminar with our students. We had 200 students. They had a master class by the master of politics, the art of politics, Mayor Willie Brown. Please welcome Mayor Brown. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind and well-deserved introduction. <laughs> I am, of course, always delighted to be in the presence of San Francisco State University. It is the institution that obviously extended to me the opportunity ultimately to be credentialed and to do all the kinds of things that I'm do. And tonight, when I heard that we were having this event, the Schultzes I recruited said, now, you guys are from Stanford. I want to show you the real Stanford. <laughs> San Francisco State University. And then you should also know that when you identified the chair of the foundation, David Serrano Sewell. David Serrano Sewell is a mentee of mine from 100 years ago. I didn't even realize that he had grown up. But we are indeed fortunate to have so many talented people like David and others who are part of this great family. San Francisco is indeed really blessed to have San Francisco State constantly on the prowl to expand the kind of things that is done in institutions of higher learning. And Leslie Wong is bringing a whole new level of leadership. And I am just delighted. And you're going to hear more about something that uh, I'm doing or with uh, the Institute, and some of our people are here tonight, and some of the persons who've been through the institution are being unusually helpful in that regard, because what I really want to do is what Secretary Schultz urged me to do a long time ago, and that's help produce a whole cadre of well-trained, talented, first-class persons who want to run for public office and serve for public office. Enjoy your meal. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Well, I tell you, it's kind of tough to follow Willie, right, anytime he's on this podium. One last uh, introduction. I'd like to recognize our academic deans, because I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the deans that really make so much of the university run in terms of 
teaching and research. So deans, would you please stand? Deans of the various, we have our six colleges. Linda Oubre, College of Business. College of Business, Ken Montero, Ethnic Studies, Alvin Alvarez, Health and Social Sciences. College of Graduate School of Education. I acknowledge Ken Montero from Ethnic Studies, Dr. Montero. Judith Munter, Graduate School of Education. Boy, I tell you, our deans are rock stars. You know, I, I referenced, and, and Mayor Brown talked about our foundation and, and David Serrano Sewell. I, you know, friends, alumni, I want you to know that President Wong has a, a big vision to increase our endowment to $100 million, $100 million in the next five years. And the person that oversees that is the chair of our Investment and Finance Committee, Kimberly Brandon, an incredible alumna and foundation. Kim, where are you? Kimberly, thank you, Kimberly. Okay. It's showtime. It's showtime. And I, I introduced the Master of Politics. Now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the Master of Art and Narrative and another individual that certainly needs no you know, formal introduction. And that's Ben Fong Torres. Yeah? I'm going to not say a whole lot about Ben because everyone knows the great story with Rolling Stone, but. I'm going to have a few of, of, of Ben's close friends kind of say a little bit about Ben as part of the introduction. Can we roll the video? Did you have Ladies and gentlemen, one? introducing Ben Fong Tellis. Thank you, Paul. Go away. Steve, we're here for the interview. I don't do interview. Oh. Hi, Steve. How you doing, Ben oh. Fong Torres? Good evening, everyone. I'm Julie Hayner. And I'm Ben Fong Torres. Good evening. Uh, this is Ben Fong Torres from San Francisco, California. Married man, right? Yes, I am. And what else can you tell us about yourself or your wife or anything you'd like to talk uh, about? My wife is married also. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. You, uh, you do, you're, you're having an autobiography. You've written an autobiography? Yes, I have. Have you lived an interesting life? People. No, I haven't, but I sold the book, so. <laughs> I see. So. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ben Fong Torres. What a lovely intro. I think I'm gonna try and use it on Match.com. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nava. Good evening. Welcome to the Willie Brown Jr. Room here at the. Ritz Carlton. Hey, why not? Our distinguished uh, San Francisco State alumnus has had a school and a bridge, well, part of a bridge, the better part. <laughs> the working part of the bridge is named after Mayor Brown. So why not this room, which may seem like a large room to you, but it's about the size of uh, Willie's walk-in closet. Dr. Wong had a very good year overseeing the continued growth of this university. He had a couple of strange moments, though, like the time that uh, uh, Donald Trump called and asked about maybe becoming president of SF State. <laughs> Dr. Wong nicely informed him that he was here for the long haul, and Mr. Trump said he would think of something else to go after. He just wants to be president of something. <laughs> as Robert mentioned, I am a proud Gator, as is my wife, Diane. And I know many of you are as well. We have much to be proud of. For more than a century, the San Francisco State has graduated hundreds of thousands of Gators who have gone on to become the backbone of the Bay Area as teachers, engineers, public servants, healthcare providers, police officers, even some journalists. The list goes on and on. And then there are those who have gone a step further to become leaders in their fields, true innovators, and nationally and internationally recognized figures who, by virtue of their accomplishments, bring added luster to our Gator community. 
This annual Alumni Hall of Fame ceremony allows us an opportunity to recognize these individuals and showcase the excellence that stems from our great university. It's a great night for San Francisco State, and I speak from experience when I tell you that it's a very special night for the honorees. I was somehow inducted into the Alumni Hall of Fame in 2003, and that same year was also named Alumnus of the Year. I think someone else was busy. <laughs> Two years later, I was the university's commencement speaker. So, when they asked me to MC, I can't really say, uh, I think there's a Warriors game on that night. <laughs> Against the Nuggets, man. It's a crucial game. They're sixth. I, I hope you enjoy the program and your meal. I ask that you place your entree choice card, if you have not already, on your plate. And this, on top of your salad, would be just fine. <laughs> this will assist the staff in bringing you, possibly, the meal you ordered. <laughs> you never know, man. It is now my honor to introduce the 13th president of San Francisco State University, Dr. Leslie Wong. Now, in his fourth year as president, Les Wong has a vision to take San Francisco State to a new level. He is tireless in his quest to tell the San Francisco State story about the faculty, students, and alumni who are influencing and changing the world. San Francisco State has a profound impact on business, the arts, health, politics, international diplomacy, education, and social justice on a local, national, and international scale. And President Wong is making sure that people everywhere know this. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome President Les Wong. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, I have the honor uh, to stand with you, our students, alumni, faculty, staff, close friends, and celebrate the accomplished alumni and honor the great public university they represent, San Francisco State University. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our distinguished honorees, their families and friends. I'd also like to express my appreciation to our generous donors whose support makes this wonderful evening impossible. I I'm just speechless over the size, the, the excitement, the noise uh, in the room. Uh, it truly is a humbling experience for Phyllis and I. Each year, we graduate approximately 8,000 students, and more than 80% remain in the Bay Area to, to live and work. And as Ben mentioned earlier, our alumni make up the very backbone of this great city through their careers in the public and private sectors. In fact, I can assure you, if every one of our alumni working in San Francisco called in sick on the same day, this city would grind to a halt. <laughs> Among them would be 70% of the teachers in the San Francisco Unified school district. A significant proportion of the San Francisco Police and Highway Patrol. I have to tell you, I met with them uh, just two weeks ago with the criminal justice program, and they promised me that they would be so fair 
that they will ticket me <laughs> whenever I was speeding or driving erratically. <laughs> and if you think of emergency services, it's amazing. And most importantly, where the soul of this university lies, most of the parks and recreation staff and the core of this city's public nonprofit sector are Gators. And many of you are, are here tonight, and I just celebrate you all. It is San Francisco State's mission to stimulate intellectual and personal development, to promote equity, and to inspire the courage to lead, to create, and to innovate. We see evidence of this all around us in San Francisco, and, we, and when we travel throughout the United States and internationally to engage our alumni. My absolute favorite phrase is the sun never sets on a San Francisco State alum, period. We will see later how our five honorees this evening exemplify these qualities at the super highest level. Last year at this very event, I announced that we would launch our first comprehensive fundraising campaign in January 2015. I am extremely pleased to report we not only formally launched what I like to call bold thinking, the campaign for San Francisco State in January, but we are off to an incredibly great start. This campaign will affirm and unleash the university's true potential as a leader in the Bay Area, the Pacific Rim, and well beyond our expectations. The campaign will allow us to really enhance the student experience at San Francisco State. It will provide the resources our faculty need and deserve to maintain the highest levels of teaching, research, and service. And it will allow us to bring our facilities up to a standard our talented faculty, staff, and students deserve. We set a timeline for the campaign of six years and a financial goal of $150 million. It gives me great pleasure to announce that we are well on our way to achieving this goal. After only 10 months, thanks to our alumni and friends, we have generated more than $34 million in gifts and pledges. And that is nearly 25% of our $150 million goal. Mr. Naba is on a torrid path and uh, we should all keep the pressure on him and all of the officers and members of our development staff in the audience tonight. They're exceptional. We know it will take the participation of many people, including many of you here in this room, to reach and indeed to surpass our goal. A stellar group of volunteers are leading this effort as our campaign cabinet. Yeah, they are doing an, ex an excellent job under le the leadership of our campaign chair, uh, John Gumas, who unfortunately couldn't be with us tonight. But please join me in thanking our campaign cabinet for their dedication to the campaign's success. So I would like to recognize those members of the campaign cabinet who are here tonight this evening and ask them to stand as I named them. And they are Sheldon Axler, the former Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. <laughs> Charlotte Ferretti, in the bright lights, I can't see where you are, Charlotte. Where are you? 
Let's give her a hand. I, I know she's in the room. Mark Johnson, I believe, and Netta Namari, who I know is here. So. And, met, and some of you who are here tonight have already made extremely generous commitments to the campaign, and we are truly grateful. Um, I'd like to take just a few moments to highlight just three of the gifts to give you just an idea of how transformational the Bold Thinking campaign will be for this university. The first gift. I want to mention tonight was inspired by Willie Brown, who has been at the center of California politics, government, and civic life for a remarkable four decades. The Willie L. Brown Jr. Fellowship Program at San Francisco State opens doors each year to a group of students who are interested in pursuing careers in public service. The students selected for this prestigious fellowship are placed with heads of various city agencies and receive hands-on experience, invaluable contacts, a $1,500 fellowship award, and for the vast majority of them, job offers after graduation. The Willie L. Brown Jr. Fellowship Program began at San Francisco State in 2008. But this year, I am delighted to tell you that the program is now funded with gifts totaling $1.1 million from a group of very generous friends. We should give them a hand. very generous friends of Mayor Brown and the university. And as a result, we will be able to support more fellows in the program each semester. And I'm gonna go off script because I have to tell you, Mr. Mayor, you provided me the singular experience of my professional career as we raised that million dollars in one evening. Thank you. Thank you. Your commitment to the university and particularly to the students is an inspiration for me and my, and my team. Making a polished and confident transition into today's highly confident job market can be a challenging, challenging uh, for a uh, event for our graduates. And to address this, we established a career services and development program in our College of Business. This College of Business Fellows Program will give our students a competitive advantage by partnering with the business community to offer professional development workshops, internships, and networking events. Many of this went to school many decades ago. But today's college student wants to get their hands, their brains, their minds into the market as soon as they can. This is a breakthrough initiative launched by Dean Linda Ubre last year, and it's made possible by a very generous $1 million grant from the Eustace Kwan Family Foundation. Let's give them a hand. And for my last example, this past June, President Obama recognized our partnership with the San Francisco Giants to establish the Junior Giants Urban Youth Academy. This pioneering partnership forged between the Giants Community Fund and San Francisco State will allow us to create the nation's first urban youth academy on a college campus. This will be a transformative resource for children and teens 
uh, from our city's most underserved neighborhoods to gather after school and learn vital life skills such as teamwork, positive self-esteem, respect for others, and a good health and fitness habits while all participating in the great American pastime. The Giants Community Fund, along with Major League Baseball, has made a commitment of $3 million to begin the planning process for this academy. And we are very proud to partner with them on this groundbreaking initiative. This takes our relationship with the Giants to a new level after the incredible, incredible opportunity we enjoyed last May to hold our commencement at AT&T Park. So I'd like to acknowledge our friends and partners from the Giants organization who are here with us tonight. And would they just stand and please be expect and uh, let's recognize them for their support. Thank you. My plan is to spend some time in the afternoon at the training center learning how to hit a slider. Ben, don't, don't go near that one, okay. <laughs> the donations I've highlighted and the many others that I would like to mention but simply can't in the interest of time are already having an impact on our students and faculty. Taken together, these visionary investments advance our mission and raise the profile of this great university and its alumni both in the Bay Area, worldwide, on behalf of everyone at this university. I want to thank you and everyone who has made a commitment to the campaign in this early months. Your leadership is a tremendous, tremendous source of motivation to us and will certainly inspire others. Okay, so it's now time to turn this program back over to Ben but before I do, I just want to express my appreciation to all of you for being here tonight. You along, you along with our many other students, faculty, alumni, and friends contribute to the energy, energy that defines this great university. I have to tell you, I that am just humbled and honored uh, to be part of a leadership team that cares deeply about our students. They care deeply about you as our supporters. But I think more importantly, all of us believe that this university, in our commitment to social justice and participating in our communities, will indeed make a difference in the lives of people throughout this city, if not throughout the world. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, President Wong. I had some of your Gatorade while you were up here. It was nice, especially with a little uh, vodka. Nice. As I have said, I've always been proud to be a Gator. Please, no photos. I've told you. <laughs> but hearing about the progress the university is making under President Wong's leadership makes me even more proud of my alma mater. So let's keep the momentum going. Now it is time. You have your steaks, your fish, your gluten-free vegan dishes in front of you. Enjoy. I'll be back later to introduce you to tonight's Honorees, thank you. So good evening once again. Table six? Yeah, all right. President Wong and I have the great pleasure of honoring our two alumni of the year. 
and inducting three new members into the San Francisco State University Alumni Hall of Fame. That's right, we do. The five outstanding individuals we honor tonight embody the qualities that San Francisco State hopes to impart to all of its students and alumni. To their varied and impressive accomplishments, they personify the essence of leadership, creativity, and innovation. One is a nurse who rose to the highest levels of the military in service to our country. One is a political activist who has fought courageously, got it, okay, for the rights of the marginalized in her native Cambodia. One is a, I feel like Casey Kasem here. <laughs> One is a former college athlete who combined his passion for sports with a flair for leadership to arrive at the Big Ten. One is a community leader who made access to health care, not just a privilege, but also a right. And one is a director who earned critical acclaim while bringing the works of living American playwrights into the spotlight. This year, we will present two awards for alumna of the year to two extraordinary women. <laughs> Among many, Bra Barbara Brannan, you blazed a trail for nurses within the armed forces as you rose through the ranks of the US Air Force to become a highly decorated major general. Yours is a story of leadership and of breaking down traditional boundaries. Let's look at her story. Barbara Brannon devoted her career in service to our country. She was the first nurse and the first woman to command an Air Force Medical Center. She rose through the ranks and became the first nurse in the history of the Air Force to become a Major General and the first two-star General Chief of the Air Force Nurse Corps and was described as a great American and a true military heroine by Senator Daniel Inouye. Barbara found her calling early, excelling in the nursing program at SF State and graduated with honors in 1972. Within a few years, she would find herself in the intensive and coronary care unit at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, newly minted as an Air Force First Lieutenant. From there, the promotions followed. Captain, Major, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, Brigadier General, and finally, Major General. So too did the assignments, seven states, as well as the District of Columbia, England, and Italy. In the midst of this, she found the time to earn another degree, a master's in cardiovascular nursing from UCSF. Within the confluence of the medical field and the military complex, Barbara flourished. Her passion for her work and talent as a leader brought her to ever-increasing positions of authority, culminating in her appointments as Assistant Air Force Surgeon General for Nursing and Assistant Air Force Surgeon General for Medical Force Development. In these dual roles, Barbara's work directly impacted tens of thousands of medical professionals responsible for providing the highest degree of combat readiness and effectiveness for Air Force personnel. Her mission was to ensure a fit and fighting force. Decorated with numerous awards and medals, including the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, and the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, and at the pinnacle of a 31-year career, Barbara decided to retire from the Air Force in 2005. While her formal role in the military would come to an end, she would continue to serve her military family in her second career, one that has turned into a labor of love. For much of the past decade, Barbara has been president and CEO of Falcons Landing, a residential community for retired and honorably discharged military officers from all branches of service as well as for senior level federal retirees and their spouses. Falcon's Landing is a place where Barbara can continue to put her numerous talents to work in the service of others, promoting the health, wellness, and best possible quality of life for our veterans and their families.
San Francisco State University is proud to name Major General Barbara Brannon 2015 Alumna of the Year. These lights are blinding. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is certainly an honor to be here this evening. And I saw that and thought, well, who is this person? So kind of let me tell you some of the background of how that all came to be. I must admit, when I received the email saying that I had been nominated for the San Francisco State University Hall of Fla Fame, oh, <laughs> perhaps. I was a little skeptical. In fact, I thought it was a scam. <laughs> I was not, however, asked to wire money to another foreign country. <laughs> so I did a little more investigation, but really they told me I was being nominated for being a distinguished military officer. And I thought, well, that's just a little bit too ironic. <laughs> because when I was at San Francisco State, it was at the height of the Vietnam War. And certainly it was at the height of the anti-war demonstrations, peace symbols everywhere, peace marches, and of course on campus, we had student strikes and demonstrations. We had the National Guard there for lunch every day. And uh, unfortunately, it often degenerated into some violent confrontations. So my time at San Francisco State was a bit more turbulent than I had anticipated and certainly was not the college experience I thought it would be. However, I will say two amazing and wonderful things did happen as a result of my time at that wonderful, wonderful school. I got my baccalaureate degree in nursing and I met my future husband, Stan. Now, how in the world did I end up in the military? You know, co coming from the Bay Area, which was certainly um, military officers weren't very highly regarded, to say the least. But uh, Stan graduated a couple years earlier, and he won the lottery. Yay! Unfortunately, it was the draft lottery. <laughs> so he knew he was going to Vietnam. Stan rushed down, talked to the Air Force recruiter because he figured if he was going to be in Vietnam, he'd rather be in the air than on the ground, which proved to be a very wise decision. We married before he left, and then um, when I graduated, I went to DC area. He was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base, and I started my nursing career there. And I worked my way up in just two short years to what I thought was going to be the ultimate nursing challenge. I was working in an emergency room. I was a little restless because I wanted more responsibility. I really needed a little bit more challenge. And I began to wonder if the nursing was really what I was meant to do. So on a whim, I called an Air Force recruiter. And I learned I was a hot commodity because I had a baccalaureate degree in nursing and they really wanted nurses with degrees. So I was offered advanced rank and they said I only had to sign up for two years. And so I thought, you know, I really have nothing to lose and in two years I should know what I want to do with the rest of my life. Well, my two years became 31. And I think it's because what I discovered is the in the Air Force, I was able to do amazing things because of the amazing group of people that I worked with. Every assignment was full of challenge, full of opportunity. You know, and all you had to do was really kind of take what presented and do the best you could. Um, and I just, 
I flourished and I loved it and it was really hard to leave. I will say my wonderful family picked up and moved 15 times with me. You know, new jobs, new schools, new friends, and sometimes they were a little less than enthusiastic. I will say particularly our son, Alex. But um, a few years after Alex graduated, he looked back and began to miss the things that he had found in the military life, and he joined the Air Force, which now we call our family business. And uh, my wonderful son, Captain Alex Brannon, and his terrific wife, Christy, are here tonight. Um, there he is. He is recently back from another deployment, and we are just so proud of the amazing work that he is doing for our nation. Now, when I retired, I thought I would never find anything to do that gave me the satisfaction and the sense of purpose that I had in the military, and yet I was so wrong, because I will say at Falcon's Landing, I have continued to serve my military family, and every single day I have the opportunity to make a really positive difference in so many lives and to kind of pay them back for all that they've done for all of us. So I think basically I owe a lot to San Francisco State. I graduated really with everything I needed to have a very successful career and really a very, very good life. It is an amazing honor to be an alumna of the year. I can't believe I'm standing here and I just want to thank, thank everyone for that um, honor. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Speaking of emergency room, have you noticed the uh, designs on the carpet look kind of like body patterns, <laughs> outlines? It's our first and last time at the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> Mu Sokua. There you are at table five. You are a political force in your native Cambodia working to empower women, the poor, and the disenfranchised, while calling for a more representative democracy. Yours is a story of courage, determination, and an unwavering commitment to social justice. Here is Mu's story. As the most prominent woman in Cambodia's political opposition, Mu Sakua's journey has taken her to remote villages, areas infested with malaria, and rice fields still strewn with landmines. Politics is about the people, she says, and during her quest to connect with the people of Cambodia, she has been bullied, arrested, imprisoned, and personally sued by the country's prime minister. She has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize and called brave, eloquent, and defiant in a country where government critics have been detained, jailed, and sometimes killed for speaking out. In 1972, Sukua left her native Cambodia, a country that for years had been wracked by war and genocide. She first moved to Paris and then joined her brother here in San Francisco. When I hit San Francisco, I knew that this was my city, she said. I began to shine. I let my hair grow. I looked like a hippie. For someone with a rebellious streak, arriving at the Golden Gate must have felt like a breath of fresh air. She thrived in San Francisco, stimulated by the city's tolerance, diversity, and activism. She learned English, she said, by listening to the Beatles. She enrolled at San Francisco State as a psychology major and earned her bachelor's degree in 1979. But while she was in San Francisco sowing the seeds for a life of political activism, events back home took a devastating turn. In 1975, the Khmer Rouge seized power in Cambodia and brought with it an unforgiving campaign of brutality, starvation, and mass killing that would eventually claim nearly two million lives or a quarter of the population. After four devastating years in power, the Khmer Rouge finally fell in 1979, leaving Cambodia crippled and traumatized. 
In response, she traveled to Thailand to assist Cambodian refugees across the border. Sukua became an advocate for human rights and devoted herself to working against the exploitation and trafficking of women and children, working to help urban and rural poor in one of the poorest countries in Asia, and encouraging women to become active in the country's male-dominated political arena. Within 10 years, she would become an advisor to the government and eventually win a seat in the National Assembly. Soon thereafter, her political ascent culminated with her appointment as the Minister of Women's and Veterans Affairs, one of only two women in the cabinet. As a minister, she campaigned against child abuse, marital rape, violence against women, human trafficking, and the exploitation of female workers. She also helped draft the country's law against domestic violence and negotiated an international agreement with Thailand to curtail human trafficking in Southeast Asia. She served as a minister for six years before finally stepping down in response to the rampant corruption that pervades Cambodian politics. Her voice, however, has been far from silent, particularly with respect to women in politics. Encouraging women to run as candidates in local elections became one of her biggest rallying points. In 2002, during what were the first local elections in Cambodia, nearly 25,000 women became candidates and more than 9% won loosening the grip of an authoritarian coalition on Cambodia's electorate is a slow and arduous process, but she insists on fighting on. She knows that the best way to help her native country is to travel throughout Cambodia, listening and talking to its citizens. She insists on the right to live a life free of fear and violence, something that most of us take for granted. I don't choose to live in fear, she says. Fear won't change anything. It is true. It is true. She learned her first English by way of Beatles songs, and her first words in English were, Obladi, Oblada, life goes on. Mu Sokua. Welcome. 2015 Alumna of the Year. Thank you. Good evening. I wish to thank this selecting committee for giving me this great honor that allows me to return to San Francisco, a city I call my second home. When I was learning English, I heard about this song, When You're Going to San Francisco. <laughs> I had no idea that I was going to be one day in San Francisco and call that great city my second home, but I don't have flower in my hair. <laughs> Lost it a long time ago. <laughs> Studying for my bachelor's degree, at San Francisco State University almost 40 years ago was not an easy task. I was one of the few Southeast Asian refugees in the program, as well as being a woman. My parents sent me far away from my home, Cambodia, for a higher education to pursue a career, I was determined not to fail them. I told myself not. <laughs> I was about 22 years old. It is here where I began to understand the meaning of building a community, the importance of social services, 
for people who are uprooted and how to rebuild a new life. I went with them, helping them get to get on welfare, for the children to get special services through the streets of Tenderloin near, near here. Is it near here? No, <laughs> near here, right. <laughs> and it is there, here, then, that I learned the meaning of building a voice. Here tonight are my friends, my colleagues, my mentors. Please stand up, you are here. You gave me that, the strength to have a voice. Please stand up, my dear friends, to that table, those two tables. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was here also that I built, I was a voice for the refugee, Cambodian refugee in the Bay Area. Fighting for justice is about making victims become survivors, and survivors need their own voices. Building democracy is about standing firm on the principles, the principles of human rights and freedoms, among them freedom of expression and freedom of speech. They put me in jail because I stood at Freedom Park for three months. I wanted the Prime Minister of Cambodia to reopen that Freedom Park, which he closed because our party, the opposition party, the Cambodia National Rescue Party was able to occupy Freedom Park for almost a year with sometimes more than 50,000, at some point 100,000 or a million, because the people, especially the youth of Cambodia, want change. We won that election in 2013, but it was manipulated, <laughs> and the power was never transferred to us. I strongly believe in giving women equal opportunities for development. Discrimination <laughs> and violence against women can only be addressed when the society as a whole recognizes that women are human beings and We are equal partners, and women's rights are human rights. You know who said that. As a woman, I lead with the strong belief that women bring stability and peace at home to their communities and for the whole nation. I feel most satisfied when the women's movement networks move together, create a critical mass, and have gained and gain political space. President Wong, distinguished members of the selecting committee, my dear friends, thank you for such a great honor. This is for my parents. I lost, never found. Who would be very proud tonight? And this is especially for my friends, for my colleagues who are still in jail in Cambodia for refusing to give in to oppression and a facade of democracy. I thank you.
Musokua. Thank you for everything. Well, now it is my great pleasure, along with President Wong, there he is, to induct three new members into San Francisco State University's prestigious Alumni Hall of Fame, the hall sponsored by the uh, SF State Alumni Association was created in 1994 to honor alumni who have distinguished themselves through extraordinary achievements in their professional and civic endeavors. Each year, the university is proud to induct a select few alumni into the Hall of Fame, showing our appreciation for their achievements as Gators and highlighting their accomplishments to the larger university community. The next time you are on campus, I encourage you to visit the lobby of the admin building where all the photos of all the Hall of Fame members are displayed. It's a pretty impressive and illustrious group and one that will fill you with pride as a fellow Gator. It also serves as a source of inspiration to the university's current students, showing them that, by example, the true measure of success is the fulfillment of one's own potential. Our first honoree is Kevin Anderson, who, yeah. who earned a BA in political science from San Francisco State in 1979 and is now playing at the top of his game as the director of athletics at the University of Maryland. Here he, is, here he is. Kevin Anderson is a nationally recognized leader in the world of collegiate athletics who remains committed to promoting academic success and community involvement. He knows how to dream big to make those dreams a reality. He is a manager, mentor, husband, and father who feels as much at home at the local YMCA as he does at the Final Four. Kevin's rise to the top tier of collegiate sports is a success story that begins right here in San Francisco at Abraham Lincoln High School. Kevin was a versatile athlete who competed on several of the school's teams. His love of the game followed him to college, where he played football under legendary SF State coach Vic Rowan while earning a bachelor's degree in political science. When Kevin joined the Stanford Athletics Department as the Director of Annual Giving, he gained valuable insight into the role that fundraising plays in collegiate athletics. As the Executive Director of the East Bay YMCA, he saw the power that sports programs can yield in shaping lives and enhancing a community. Kevin eventually joined the staff at UC Berkeley, where he rose through the ranks of the athletics department while honing his fundraising, management, and public relations skills. As the executive associate athletics director at Oregon State, Kevin oversaw seven sports, including football and men's and women's basketball. In 2004, Kevin made history when he was appointed the first African-American athletic director at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. At Army, he assumed the responsibility of a 25-sport program and a massive budget deficit. Over the next six years, he led a resurgence that saw 20 Army teams earn bursts in NCAA championships in 10 different sports, while at the same time turning that million-dollar deficit into a nearly $3 million surplus. Today, Kevin manages a budget of more than $90 million and more than 500 student-athletes as Director of Athletics at the University of Maryland. Since 2010, Kevin has guided Maryland to four national championships, five national championship final appearances, and 11 trips to the final four. Off the field, Kevin pioneered the Maryland Way Guarantee, a nationally recognized program that guarantees financial aid to student athletes all the way to graduation, even when they are no longer able to compete as athletes. Kevin has led numerous fundraising campaigns at Maryland, including the $150 million renovation and expansion of Coldfield House and a $10 million annual giving campaign to support student-athlete scholarships. Perhaps the most transformational moment for Kevin and the Terrapins arrived on July 1, 2014, when Maryland officially became a member of the Big Ten Conference, ushering in a new era for the university and its teams. While his career has brought him prominence on a national level, Kevin has never wavered in his commitment to the local community. He currently serves on the board of the YMCA of Central Maryland and of the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. He has also shared his expertise with colleges and universities across the country as past president and vice president of the National Association of Collegiate Directors of Athletics. 
In 2013, Kevin was recognized by the Washington Business Journal as one of the top 25 minority business leaders in the Washington, D.C. region. He was also recognized as one of the top 13 sports power players in Maryland by Pressbox Magazine. From high school athlete to Big Ten director, Kevin Anderson has turned his love of sports into an extraordinary career, one that touches the lives of countless students, athletes, and sports fans across the country. With the Golden State Warriors up 30 points right now at halftime, it's a great honor and pleasure to formally induct and welcome Kevin Anderson to the SF State University Alumni Hall of Fame. All right. Good evening. It's a great evening to be a Gator. So when they told me I had two to three minutes, uh, my friends at the table said it takes him two or three minutes to say thank you, so bear with me just a minute. You know, I am extremely humbled to be in front of you tonight to accept this award. I want to thank and I want to congratulate all the other award winners tonight. And General, I was with you. I thought it was a prank phone call at first. <laughs> Dr. Wong, President Wong, Phyllis, thank you for your leadership and what you do for our great school. Uh, there's one gentleman that I want to recognize tonight, and um, he's a mentee of mine who, when uh, I talked to Dr. Wong about the athletic director's position, I said, I have the right person for you. Charles, stand up, please. <laughs> Charles Guthrie is one of the best and young athletic directors in the country, and he's doing a fantastic job for our school. Now, I, I'm up here because of the people in my life, and there's a table full of folks that we were a community that were born and raised right around San Francisco State. But before that, um, most of you don't know that I did coach a little bit of football, and I was a special teams coach. And one of the things that I did best was I punted, but sometimes I would punt and uh, I would uh, out punt my coverage. And the proof of it is, is my wife Moira right there. So Moira, I love you. I have another football coach here, my son Kevin, that I'm very proud of. He's an educator in Minnesota and he's gonna make me a grandfather at the end of November. I love you, son. So we talk about this community that was surrounding San Francisco State. And uh, my sisters and brothers from another mother are here today. And they're the Toller family. And uh, I can't say how much they've meant to me in my life growing up uh, in San Francisco and attending high school and college with them. And um, the one thing that uh, I wish, Mu, as you did, that my parents were here tonight and their parents because you know, they said that I was the first. Well, I wasn't the first because Burl Toller was the first and he was the only for a quite some time. So when you talk about a pioneer and a trailblazer like Mayor Brown here, those are the true pioneers and people that have really made a difference in my life and people's lives in this room. So thank you very much. Now, one of my former high school teammates is here, Judge Martin Jenkins. And uh, Marty set a very high standard for me and always challenged me. So in my freshman year at Abraham Lincoln High School, we were on a thing that was called the Gump Squad. And we'd have to scrimmage against the uh, older players and that uh, I was about 150 pounds and Marty was about 160 pounds and we used to have to uh, go against the offensive linemen that were about 230 and 40 pounds. <laughs> and when they called my name, I hated that. <laughs> but Marty was up there, had a smile on his face and he was a little crazy because he would challenge these big guys and for the most part he beat them. So Marty, love you, thank you for everything you've done in my life. So as I moved forward and I became involved with the YMCA, Alameda District County Attorney Nancy O'Malley's here. 
And Nancy has played a big part in my life, particularly we were able to do some things in the East Bay that really made me understand the value of athletics with young women. And she's formed several programs that have really made a difference. So Nancy, thank you for being here. Now the people responsible for my wife are here too, my in-laws, James and Chris McNamara, so thank you. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about my experience. I grew up about five miles from San Francisco State. My friends live probably even closer. I worked at QFI when it was in Stonestown. Every day I passed this great university. And then I had the opportunity to go and play for Vic Rowan. And Vic helped mold my life very early on. He was a tremendous football coach, but even a better person. And he was a leader of young men, and he did so much for so many. And I really owe Coach Rowan for helping me with that. Now, I know my two minutes is probably up, so there's two stories that I'm going to share. <laughs> this is, you're not going to pull me off the stage here. OK. So, one of my professors, Kay Lawson, Political Science 101. So that was my first class at San Francisco State. And so she handed out a list. And on this list, there were 15 books. And she started to say that we're going to read each and every one of those books. And I looked at the teammate and I said, damn, she, she got to be kidding. <laughs> no, she wasn't. And I repeated that course. <laughs> but she was involved in my beginning and my end. She called me in her office, and surprisingly, I had gained enough hours and credits to graduate. And she sat me down, and she said, you know, Kevin, I've been through this journey with you, and now it's time for you to part. And I'm very proud of you because I know you did withdraw from my class in your freshman year, but you came back and you stuck with it, and now you're going to go out and represent our university and do great things. And so I truly appreciate her and her dedication to not only me, but to all of us who have had somebody in our lives to make it possible for us to be successful. So the last story I'll tell you is about Vic Rowan. So it was about the fourth or fifth game that we played my freshman year. And I had a friend who was a running back, and his name was Rusty Keys. And Rusty had a great day, and he had about 90, 95 yards. They called a sweep around my end. And I went out, and I thought I had a heck of a block. And I hit my man, and I fell right in front of the bench. Flag came out, and I knew it couldn't have been on me. Well, Coach Rowan grabbed me by the seat of my pants and helped me off the field and said, yeah, that penalty was on you. Well, Rusty ran for about 10 or 15 yards on that play, and he would have broken 100 yards. And it was the first time in a long time that a San Francisco State running back would have done that. But with that call and that penalty, Rusty ran for 98 yards. And uh, he did not get 100. So that was probably the last play I played. I had hurt my knee. And so that's when I knew the value of education. And I was able to go and, um, and do some things in life that hopefully that I am doing what uh, people and the faculty at San Francisco State has done for me. Because there's true value in the scholarship. And you know, we hear a lot of negative things about what we do in intercollegiate athletics, but it's people like me that had that opportunity, that were able to go to a university and pursue a fine education and be able to do great things with it. So, President Wong, I want to thank you and everybody in this room for providing someone like me an education, and hopefully I'll continue to do good things with it and represent our fine university. So, I wish you a great night and go Gators.
Go Gators! Our next honoree attended SF State in 1969 and 1970, earned a degree in health administration from St. Mary's College, and is now a major force in providing high quality health care to the Asian and Pacific Islander community as CEO of Asian Health Services. Sherry Hirota is a health advocate who looks beyond the walls of the doctor's office to the larger policy issues of the day. She is a bridge between the healthcare industry and the Asian Pacific Islander community to ensure that its members receive care that is culturally and linguistically appropriate. Sherry has been a voice for the immigrant and low-income communities of the Bay Area. Every year, tens of thousands of area residents receive the health care they need and deserve thanks to the work that Sherry has done throughout her challenging but ultimately fulfilling career. After five years of full-time grassroots organizing in San Francisco and Los Angeles, Sherry returned to her native Bay Area. While in need of a school physical for her son, she made her way to the Asian Health Services, a free primary care clinic in Oakland that catered to the needs of the Asian community. In the early 70s, few healthcare providers understood the languages or cultures of the Asian immigrants who were settling in the San Francisco Bay Area. At the time, the clinic was just a storefront with a small staff and in need of an office manager. With a background in community organizing and administration, Sherry thought the job might be a good match. In 1977, at the clinic's first general meeting about healthcare issues, only one patient showed up. Sherry recognized the need for more effective and personal patient outreach, and her approach paid off. 100 patients attended the second annual meeting, and even more came the following year. Eventually, Sherry would be appointed executive director of the clinic, and under her leadership, Asian Health Services evolved into a comprehensive primary care facility serving thousands of families. Sherry and her staff continued to advocate for multilingual, multicultural health care at the local, state, and national levels. She crafted the first ever cultural competence standards for California's Medi-Cal managed care contracts and testified before Congress regarding language barriers to health care for the underserved. Sherry quickly began to attract the attention of numerous national organizations, including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which named Sherry a community health leader in 1994. She used part of the funds that came with this prestigious award to buy headsets for simultaneous translation at the Asian Health Services annual meetings where it isn't uncommon to hear eight different Asian languages spoken in addition to English. The increased visibility that came with Sherry's leadership brought with it additional support that eventually enabled Asian Health Services to buy several high-profile buildings in Oakland's Chinatown neighborhood and attract over $20 million in donations and grants. Today, with the staff proficient in English and 15 Asian language and an annual budget of $39 million, Asian Health Services serves more than 27,000 patients annually, 70% of whom live below the poverty line. The clinic has nine different service sites, including primary care, comprehensive dental services, and behavioral health. As CEO, Sherry continues to explore new ways of helping the center's clients while lending her energy and expertise to other community organizations. She is an Emeritus Board Member of the California Endowment and founding Board Member of the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations and Asian and Pacific Islander Healthcare Forum. Sherry has been rightly honored by numerous organizations for her extraordinary work on behalf of the Asian Pacific Islander community including the California Wellness Foundation, the Alameda County Women's Hall of Fame, and the 16th Assembly District of California, which named Sherry Woman of the Year. But in the end of the day, Sherry notes that, the measure of success is not in how many patients we serve, but how much the community understands and asserts its right to health care. I'd like to add a personal note. Asian Health Services is located in what used to be the Silver Dragon Restaurant in Oakland Chinatown. It was the second location for the Silver Dragon 
The first was on Webster Street at what used to be the New Eastern Cafe. It was owned by my parents, and that's where we, the kids, were raised for several years in the 50s small world. It is now my great honor and pleasure to formally induct and welcome Sherry Hirota to the San Francisco State University Alumni <laughs> Hall of Fame. Sherry. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, I thought it was important to note that all these accomplishments didn't happen my, by myself. So I'd like to acknowledge my mother, who is here tonight. <laughs> my partner, Dr. Frank Brown, and his family. my daughter, Jennifer, my son, Jackson, my grandson, Victor. But also, I'd like to acknowledge the family of Asian Health Services who are here tonight. Could you please stand? So Ben uh, spoke a little bit uh, about how his family owned the restaurant that later became Silver Dragon in Oakland Chinatown. And just recently, Asian Health Services has built a 15,000 square foot clinic in that building. But lest you feel that we have taken over Chinatown with our health services, it's important to note that if you read the recent East Bay Express article about the concern of displacement of our cultural communities such as Chinatown, that the area around the two census tracts around Asian health services is 88% Asian. And I think that that's a tribute to both Asian health services and the wonderful nonprofits uh, that exist in partnership with the, the restaurants and merchants in Oakland Chinatown. So thank you for this honor tonight. I'd like to say that there are events and individuals and circumstances that can shape our lives immensely. For me, it was 1969, being a student at San Francisco State University. The Third World Strike was a defining moment at San Francisco State, which established the core values of equity and social justice that remains part of the university today. The establishment of the first College of Ethnic Studies, it's, yes. inspired a movement around the country to reflect our culturally complex pluralistic society. It helped to make our institutions of higher learning more inclusive and relevant to people of color who had been invisible at, in most college curriculum, faculty, and student politics. So I was a direct beneficiary of the hard fought demands and struggle that took place with the Third World Strike. It helped me shape an identity and a moral compass that has lasted over 45 years. So many organizations like Asian Health Services that grew out of the civil rights and ethnic studies movement was really an important um, tribute to the work that, and the values that were uh, established with the Third World Strike and ethnic studies. Bringing the fruits of education back to the community became a rallying call for many ethnic studies programs around the country. For Asian health services, the lack of access to health care due to language and cost was a major problem in Oakland Chinatown and the grow growing Asian American population. So 40 years later, AHS has become a new standard of culturally competent care. We have become a national model that creates a different standard in, and impacts access and a more equitable health system throughout the country. So I say that advocacy remains an important part of the legacy of Asian Health Services and of the ethnic studies movement. It is part of the soul of San Francisco State. So I believe that this, these are important is an important legacy that is needed more than ever in our country today. 
So with that, I'm honored to be inducted to the San Francisco State Hall of Fame, and I will do my best to continue to deserve this recognition. Thank you very much. I still get some confused once in a while going in there and thinking it's still the silver dragon. <laughs> I walk in the lobby, turn right, and look for a scotch and water, you know? <laughs> they do have it, actually, for certain special patients. <laughs> Our final honoree is Daniel Sullivan, who graduated from San Francisco State in 1962, wow, with a degree in drama. <laughs> and during a remarkable career, spanning more than 50 years, became one of the most respected directors in American theater. Here's some proof. Daniel Sullivan is one of the most respected figures in American theater, respected by playwrights and actors alike for his sensitivity and skill in bringing great works of contemporary and classic theater to the stage. As a director, he has been compared to Fred Astaire for the way he makes things so polished, appear so effortless. As a student at San Francisco State, Daniel says he needed something to do with his nights and a way to meet girls. So he acted in plays such as Toad of Toad Hall and Desire Under the Elms, as well as musicals like Kiss Me Kate and The Pajama Game. After Daniel graduated in 1962 with a degree in drama, he joined SF State professors Herbert Blau and Jules Irving whose San Francisco Actors Workshop had been formed 10 years earlier and now recognized as one of the six founding companies of the regional theater movement in the United States. In 1965, Blau and Irving were invited to New York to establish the Repertoire Theater of Lincoln Center, and Daniel followed. Still in his 20s, Daniels took in everything the New York theater world had to offer. He found inspiration in the performances of Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino whom he later directed in the production of Merchant of Venice, served as stage manager for the musical Hair, and acted in productions at Lincoln Center, where, in 1971, he directed his first play, A.R. Gurney's Scenes from American Life. The following year, the Drama Desk Award for Most Promising Director affirmed his considerable talent. Eventually, Daniel would return to the West Coast and join the Seattle Repertory Theater, becoming its artistic director for over 18 years, leading it to a regional Tony Award and on to national prominence. Daniel has received seven Tony Awards and five Drama Desk Award nominations for Best Director over four decades of work and more than 40 productions on Broadway, including The Heidi Chronicles, Conversations with My Father, Mornings at Seven, Prelude to a Kiss, Ah, Wilderness, and A Moon for the Misbegotten. In 2001, he won the Tony for his riveting production of the play Proof. Other awards include the George Abbott Lifetime Achievement Award, the Obie Award, the Outer Critics Circle Award, the NAACP Image Award, the Ovation Award, the Joan Coleman Award for Extraordinary Creativity, and the Julia Hansen Award for Excellence. Over the years, he developed memorable partnerships with many of the country's great playwrights, including Wendy Wasserstein, Arthur Miller, Herb Gardner, and Lynn Nottage. He nurtured the theater's newest talent and earned the trust of the most respected actors, including Mary Louise Parker, Denzel Washington, John Lithgow, and San Francisco State Hall of Fame member Annette Benny. In addition to his work as a director, Daniel is shaping a new generation of theater professionals as the Swanland Chair and Professor of Theater at the University of Illinois. In 2011, Daniel was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame, joining a pantheon of theater luminaries who not only lit up the Great White Way, but also nurtured and sustained America's regional theaters, focused the spotlight on playwrights of genius, and most of all, created enduring theatrical experiences that will be remembered for years to come. Wow, wow, wow. It's our great honor, pleasure to formally induct and welcome Daniel Sullivan to the San Francisco State University Alumni Hall of Fame.
I like the whole uh, two-minute limit thing, and you will too. Uh, 1962, I graduated. That's actually a lie, I have to say, Ben. Sorry. Um, I was supposed to graduate in 1962, but when I uh, went to state in, in 1958, uh, they had um, a requirement, a physical education requirement. Uh, and uh, I was pretty good about it for a long time. I took boxing, wrestling, and folk dancing in one semester. <clears throat> but the, by the time I turned 21, um, I still had one semester to go. And uh, so I looked at what I could take, what was left, and there was bowling. But since I turned 21 and I could drink, uh, the bowling class was at 8 in the morning. <laughs> so I just didn't show up. <laughs> um, so I didn't graduate. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth now. I did not graduate. <laughs> Sorry. And then sometime in the late 70s, they sent me a letter that said, we've gotten rid of the physical education requirement. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't know what the moral of that is, but you know, <laughs> you could just wait them out. Uh, anyway, um, uh, certainly when I was at State, I was sort of forming my life. Um, but more than anything, when I think back on it now, I know that everything I have done with my life for the last 50 years, I really learned at State. Um, I think most of the people that I know who are in the theater uh, uh, as uh, producers, as designers, um, as directors are people who began as actors. And they may have not gotten further than the, the fifth grade Christmas play, uh, but the idea of standing in front of people and pretending to be somebody else uh, was a kind of thrill that I was introduced to at State College. Uh, I was given tremendous opportunities there. Uh, and I actually directed, I don't know if they still do it. Do they still do campus capers? <laughs> campus capers with a K. <laughs> uh, and they would select someone to direct it every year, and it was a musical review. And I got to do that in 1961 and 62. And by the time I had graduated from State College, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell actors what to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I am very proud of my time at State, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity to tell everybody here uh, how much I valued my time, uh, what an extraordinary faculty we had, and I'm sure still have at State, uh, how um, demanding, uh, inspiring, um, uh, and giving they were. Um, and I carry that with me uh, every day of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Sullivan. Uh, what? Oh, we're just hearing from a, a replay booth in Maryland. It turns out that we committed a foul. We did not, what? Yeah, we did not show a video from Friends of Kevin Anderson. So let's, uh, 
Let's do a replay on that, okay? Kevin, on behalf of all of your colleagues here at the University of Maryland, I would like to extend to you our warmest congratulations on the honor that's been bestowed upon you by the alumni of your alma mater, your induction to the Hall of Fame of San Francisco State University. You make us proud. We are proud of you. Congratulations. Kevin, congratulations to you. Congratulations to all the alumni out there as well. I know it's an esteemed Hall of Fame that you have, and uh, I couldn't be happier for you. So from all of us here at Under Armour, the more than 11,000 strong we have today, thanks so much and congratulations. What I have here is our Maryland helmet to let the good people from San Francisco know where Kevin is at the present time. I don't have it turned around because guess what? On the other side it says ACC. Kevin has taken us to the Big Ten. We are Big Ten and we are top ten in every category thanks to Kevin Anderson. Go Kevin and congratulations. A well-deserved honor for an extraordinary individual. Uh, we are so proud of you here at the University of Maryland. Uh, good luck and God bless and congratulations. We're proud of you. You continue to do a great job in representing yourself and your family in San Francisco State. As you can see, behind me is a picture of the Bay Bridge connecting San Francisco to Oakland. So have a great evening. This serves as recognition of your leadership, not just in athletics, but in your passion for guiding and helping young student athletes both on and off the field in their athletic and professional endeavors. Well deserved, my friend. What you've done for the universities, for the schools that you've worked at, and how, how you help so many people. Personally, I really appreciate your friendship. You've been a great friend to me. I hope all of your friends are there. I know it's a great time for you to be able to see them, but at the same time, for all the people that you've touched, for all the universities that you've helped be better places, congratulations. Congratulations. We're so proud to call you our athletic director. Thank you for your continued support in everything we do. Congratulations, Mr. Anderson. Go Terps! On behalf of the entire Maryland Athletics family, we want to wish you the best on your induction into the San Francisco State Alumni Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Kevin. You're the best. Congratulations, Dad. We love you. That was so lovely. Let's play a video of friends of Musakuba and Barbara Brandon now. <laughs> also, we have a video tribute to Willie Brown. <laughs> Charlotte Maillard is next. No, no, nah, just kidding. On behalf of President Wong and the entire San Francisco State University community, I congratulate all of this evening's honorees. And at this time, will all of the previous Hall of Fame members here at this evening, please stand so we can acknowledge you. Don't be shy. <laughs> and in closing, I hope that everyone feels inspired like I do by each of our honorees and also feels a great sense of pride to be part of the San Francisco State University community. The stories we have heard tonight clearly demonstrate that San Francisco State University is not only a gateway to success in life, but also an invaluable asset to the Bay Area and well beyond. Congratulations, President Wong. Thank you for joining us. Good night.